Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rapture Series Part 7. Today, we are going to discuss 2 Thessalonians 2, um, the falling away <laughs> argument, and we will also be talking a little bit about the restrainer. But before we begin, let's pray. Father Almighty God, I thank you so very much for this day and for everyone that has tuned in. And Lord, I just pray that you bless them with understanding, with wisdom from above. I pray, Father, that you give all people eyes to see and ears to hear only your truth, Father, away from the lies and the confusion of the world and the enemy. I thank you, God, for your wisdom. I thank you for everything that you give us. And I just pray, Father, that you bless and sanctify this time that we have together. Holy Spirit, take complete control. Let it be God's truth, not mine, that I speak in Jesus' name. I pray that you sanctify us with the word and just guide us and, and, and protect us and keep the enemy's arrows out. In Jesus' name, Father, place your hedge of protection around each and every one of us. And I just pray that you guide us with your understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and all God's children say, amen. Okay, so let's talk about this because this is something that, again, we as Christians are not meant to um, argue about God's word. Um, we're to confront God's word with a humble heart, right? And we're to come to the Lord um, with a humble heart and ready to receive what he has for us. The word of God, as one pastor put it, is, uh, comes with wisdom in it already. We are not to rely on our own understanding. We are to study and rightly divide in the manner that Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 tells us we are to uh, study and rightly divide, taking precip upon precip line upon line, here a little, there a little, like pieces of a puzzle, the Bible trend, the Bible does um, interpret itself, but we need to study, we need to rightly divide, uh, we need to treat God's word with the utmost respect, and take what we have and what we're given, uh, and not add or take away from what is there, okay, so let's begin. First, um, we're going to go ahead and read 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, and uh, Paul writes the following. Paul wrote the following. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Pause for a minute. First and foremost, there are two distinct things that are mentioned. Um, he is talking to you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Okay? Okay that ye, and we're going to continue reading, that ye, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. Pause. What day? Look at verse two. Keep it in context. The day of Christ. Okay. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day, meaning the day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The day of Christ shall not come until there comes a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalted himself about above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And we know that is speaking of the Antichrist. Okay. So let's pause for a minute. Let's really take in, first of all, what we see in these first four verses of second Thessalonians uh, two in the beginning of it in context where, where two things are highlighted, right? So Paul says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Okay, two distinct things. Then we read that ye be not soon shaken in mind. He's trying to calm them or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that day, as that the day of Christ is at hand. 
Um, they had received uh, forged letters as if from Paul um, that the day had come. Um, they were fearful. Remember that um, these are the earlier letters that Paul wrote, right? And um, the, the, these are baby Christians that he is addressing. It was a new church that he had set up, right? And um, they're fearful. What are, they, what are they fearful of? Somebody had convinced them that the day of Christ had come. And there were certain things that were supposed to happen before that day came that, that obviously had not come because that day had not come, if that made sense. So contingent upon the day of Christ, um, he is reiterating to them here, a falling away happens first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist, right? Before the day of Christ should come. So they're thinking, because of everything they saw happening, because of forged letters, that that day had come. So they missed something. So there's a fear. They, this is their thinking. There's a fear. Remember that this is a time with no cell phones, right? No computers, no internet. So whatever it is that should serve as a sign that Paul is trying to explain to them should calm them, right? Is something that they would have visibly seen because there were no phones, there was no internet, and, and in order to see something spiritually among baby Christians at a time of great persecution. Let's keep going and you'll understand what I mean in a minute. I'm going ahead of myself. So for here, for what we look at with these four um, verses, first and foremost, two things are spoken of, right? Day of the Lord and gathering unto him, uh, unto Christ. And then he, um, they are told uh, that they, that that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as, a, as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. Um, in other words, don't worry. I don't want you to, I want you to calm down. I don't want you to, to, to react in a way as if you read a, a letter from us that the day of Christ has come. Let no man deceive you. Come on, he's telling you. He's telling, I'm paraphrasing. Um, don't be deceived. Um, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And then we read after that, and that man of sin be revealed, that son of perdition. So if you haven't seen that come, it's not the day of Christ yet, he's telling them, okay? He's trying to calm them. Baby Christians, these are his earlier letters. It was one of the churches that he had just set up. And at a time of great persecution, everything they see happening and the le false uh, letters that they're receiving, now they're kind of a, um, um, I'm trying not to use, I'm trying to use as uh, simplified um, terms as possible, but you know, they're, they're scared. And, and they think that a time has come that Paul would have spoken to them about before that had not come yet. And, and there's a reason why I say that Paul spoke to them um, about that before. I didn't pull that out of a hat. Let's, let's move on. First and foremost, the word gathering in 2 Thessalonians 2, um, 1, when we read that second thing that is spoken of here, by our gathering together unto him, um, it's the word episunigoge, and that's the best enunciation I can do. I'm sorry if I butchered that up. And it means a gathering. It's the Strong's, um, the Greek Strong's 1997, and it means a gathering together, an assembly. Um, in Help's Word Study, uh, we read a grouping together, right? Um, so when we read, obviously you know, um, the coming of the Lord, uh, what that's pertaining to, but it's also speaking of, and by our gathering together unto him, which we understand to be the rapture. Um, so when we, when we are looking at this, at chapter, uh, at Second Thessalonians 2, one thing you have to put, keep in mind, sometimes we humans, if we act in pride and we want to be right, we will pick and choose parts of the, not we, not I, but I'm saying this is a habit that's put in place by many who call themselves Christians, and they take scripture out of context, 
They bend and twist and try to manipulate the word to try to force it to agree with an interpretation so that they can be right. That is the wrong way to treat the word of God. And we read in scripture that every idle word you speak there, you will give account at the time of judgment. There are consequences for treating God's word in such a manner. An idle word, uh, according to one pastor, the way he put it, is a word that is spoken without having done your research. Um, you don't want to speak idly without studying and rightly dividing the word of God. You want to be very careful as a child receiving that which we have and not add or take away to what is there. So the gathering together um, unto him is speaking of the rapture. Um, the coming of the Lord, you should know about that already because the Lord has promised that he is coming back. Um, you know that if you have a studied scripture and there is, um, I, I put rapture series, I believe it's part three, uh, speaks of the difference between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture and the second coming are two distinct events according to the word of God. And I would refer you to please review the other um, rapture series parts in order for you to understand uh, anything that I add on to that so that I don't have to keep going backward because I'm telling you the word of God rightly divided, studied and in context, it's there and it's beautifully, it, everything falls in place. Nothing is confusing if you study and you rightly divide the word. So we see here then that um, gathering is pertaining to the rapture and the coming of the Lord. Um, they're speaking of two distinct things in 2 Thessalonians 2. And when we read, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, it's speaking of the day of Christ. Okay, that should be very clear. All right. Um, another word now that we're going to <laughs> focus on is falling away. When we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day pertaining to, look at verse 2, day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. We're going to deal with this first, okay? So a falling away first. A falling away has to come first before that day. What day? The day of Christ, right? Okay. And let's look at the original meaning of falling away because there are a lot of theories out there and there's a lot of um people who speak dogmatically and and we're going to look at the the facts here in front of us before we go ahead and jump the gun and jump to popular i don't um learn scripture by way of what's popularly um accepted i go into the word I pray for Holy Spirit to help me understand. At times I will fast if it's something uh, that is difficult and, and, and I, really, um, I really feel in my heart God wants us to understand it. Um, otherwise, I will um, study, uh, rightly divide, use the word of God, use the concordance, look at the original language and pray. The Bible says, ask for wisdom and God will give it to you abundantly. Prayer is powerful. I go and I ask God um, to help me understand if there's something that I don't understand. And I'm telling you, he will give you that wisdom from above. So when we're looking at, at the word, the original Greek word from the original manuscript that was translated to the phrase of falling away, it's the word apostasia. And it um, is listed as defection revolt. Its, its usage is defection, apostasy, revolt. When you, do, when you dig deeper into the language, into the word apostasia in the Greek, using a helps word study, you see that uh, the word apostasia comes from 868, and I'm not going to try to enunciate that, but leave, depart, um, which is derived from 575 also, away from. Um, and 2476 stand. So the Greek language is very specific. The meaning in the words, um, when you take them apart, you get a little picture, a little synopsis of what the word means. So when you dig deep, it means departure, and it can mean a spiritual departure or a physical departure, okay? And you can dig deeper on your own study on the Greek language um, on the actual word, take take the root 
of the words and what they mean. And you will see apostasia can be a physical departure and a spiritual departure. Okay. Now, when we go and we um, hold on to that, because I'm coming back to that. But when we go back into, um, God bless you. Sorry, excuse me. Um, when we go to Second Thessalonians 2, 2, and we look at uh, Day of Christ, you know, I have a lot of people with a lot of different theories. Uh, I do your own study. Again, I always encourage you, don't take my word for it. I give you enough information where you can go and you can start digging deep into your own study. And again, with prayer, with a humble heart, looking at what's there, not adding or taking away, digging into the original language, um, letting the Bible interpret itself, you begin to get a prophetic puzzle piece, a, a, a synapsis, a, a, a bird's eye view to what it is that the Lord is doing in his prophecies with scripture, studying, rightly dividing, okay? So when we look at the day of Christ, to me, when I think of, when I look at day of Christ, or day of the Lord, in my eyes, it would appear to be one and the same. Now, I am understanding that in some verses, you will read day of Christ, and it will speak of a joy for us at the day of Christ, believers, um, but when you read of the day of the Lord, it's a scary thing, right? For who? For us? No, for them. And that's the distinction you have to make. Um, but I believe it's one in the same in my, in, in from what I've studied and what I've seen. The day of Christ. Who is Christ? Well, he's the Lord. Right now we're in the um, uh, acceptable year of the Lord, right? It's a time span. It's an age. Year um, means age. And it's the church age of grace. You know, um, when you look into the original language for acceptable, which is what the Lord declared after he was baptized and after he was tested of the enemy, right? He went into um, the synagogue and he declared the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. Acceptable means um, um, favor. Um, grace means favor kindness. Um, year means age. It's the church age of grace. And if you read in Isaiah 61, which is where the Lord read from, you see that um, even the gospel is mentioned, the good news, right? Um, and so the Lord was telling us what he was about to do in that, in this age that he started when he declared that time uh, back a couple thousand years ago. So we are in the church age of grace. And we read um, that there the Lord has uh, uh, fullness of times in Ephesians 1, 2, right? Dispensational fullness of times. When you are studying your prophecy, when you are studying the, the, the Bible prophecies of, of which the Bible is one third of, you cannot step out of the order, the precepts, the, de the decree that the Lord has laid out for his prophecies or you will get it wrong. We are in the church age of grace. When Jesus read from Isaiah 61, he closed the book, not yet declaring the days of vengeance which follow. When you take the Bible and you take a concordance and look, at, look for um, day of vengeance or days of vengeance, you will learn that it begins during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy during that seven-year period. Um, I would refer you to um, study Luke 21 and Matthew 24. And what you will find is that much of Luke 21 mirrors Matthew 24, um, which describes the events before, during, and after the Great Tribulation. And you will also learn that what Luke 21 uh, refers to as days of vengeance and wrath, um, um, Matthew 24, speaking of the same time period, calls it the Great Tribulation. So the days of vengeance begin during that 70th week, which falls totally in line and in the order the Lord has decreed, because right now we're in the church age of grace, the acceptable year of the Lord, as the Lord has declared it. And then he closed the book, not yet declaring what follows. If you follow, if you go to Isaiah 61, you will see that the Lord, and you compare it with Luke 4, which is, I believe, where we read of when, when Jesus declared the acceptable year of the Lord, you know that he closed the book 
um, not yet declaring the days of vengeance, which is what followed the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, if that makes sense. So right now we look at uh, a falling away and we learn that it um, can be a uh, physical departure or a spiritual departure, which, which, which should begin to make sense with what I was talking about earlier. We're talking about a time without telephones. We're talking about a time uh, a couple thousand years ago when, um, what was it, around 50 AD, when uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 was written. There was no phones, there were no computers, um, right? Um, and, and for them, baby Christians, at a time of great persecution, to be able to see a spiritual departure when the, sh when the church was just starting to get built, that they would know it would serve as a sign for them, it does not make any sense. Because remember, this is something when Paul is telling them, when he's calming them down, he even tells them, as you'll see in a little bit, remember not I told you about these things when I saw you as he's trying to calm them down because they feel like they have missed something. Okay, so let's, let's move on. So here, when talking about the day of Christ, as I mentioned, we read the following in Philips 1.10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. In Philippians 2.16 we read, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You know, when we think of um, what will be our portion, the church, the faithful church, right? Versus the portion of those who are unbelievers, sinners, who will be here during that time, right? Now we, the church, if you have looked, if you have studied and rightly divided, if you have uh, followed the instructions in Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 uh, of how we understand doctrine, and if you came to the Lord's word with a humble heart, not one of pride, and if you have reviewed also uh, the pre-tribulation, um, the rapture series part three, which speaks of the pre-tribulation and how it is that I dogmatically say it is pre-tribulation according to what Jesus himself shows us in the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? If you review that, then you understand that the church will not be here in any part of that seven-year period that has the great tribulation days of vengeance you know uh in it so for our portion we will be with the lord down here it's going to be a bad day a bad um hour it's the hour of temptation it's the 70th week of daniel's prophecy it's a a days that we read will be worse than ever there has been on the earth where people will seek death and not find it where evil incarnate will walk the land and my will he be doing a lot of wicked stuff on this earth when you read the seven seals the seven bowls the seven trumpets even there will be seven thunders when you read those and you read the description of everything that's going to be happening here that's not our portion that's not for the church the church is going to be in total bliss in heaven with our savior with our lord with with our bridegroom okay so yes we for us it will be a happy event during that time period but for them down here it will not so when i read this i don't get confused because i understand our portion and what where we'll be until we come down with christ in judgment but for the church, it will not be a bad time because we will not be here during this segment of time, the next segment of time that follows that 70th week, our portion is in heaven, joint heirs with Christ, okay? So um, we read in Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Pay attention. Today, we're in the acceptable year of the Lord. We read of the day of the Lord, and we read of the hour of temptation, right? When you understand that, um, even John said, um, it is the last hour, right? And the Antichrist is coming, right? 
um, many Antichrist spirits are here, but the Antichrist is coming, future, right? So we know that the way that the Lord, the Lord we read, a day, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. God is outside of time, right? Um, we, however, are, excuse me, we, however, um, are confined to time and space. God is outside of time, okay? And so we cannot ignore that when you look at the original language, um, these are segments of time. Um, we know that the Antichrist, for example, um, in I believe it's Revelation 17, we read that he will have 10 kings, right, who give him their power, and he in turn will make them part of his Antichrist kingdom, and they will be one hour with the beast, have a kingdom one hour. They're not crowned yet, but they have one hour with the beast. That's not speaking of a 60-minute interval of time. It's speaking of that 70th week, that seven-year period. The increments of time, the way they're spoken of in scripture, you have to study and you have to be really careful and pay attention. It's not one day. It's a segment of time, okay? Um, for example, 2,000 years have passed, right, about since uh, the Lord uh, was on the earth. Um, and to us, it's a very long time. And look at all the changes you see on earth today. Um, look at uh, the condition of the world today. Um, look at the, uh, the viciousness with which um, humans are against other humans. Look at uh, sin, how it resembles much of the, what we read about the times of Saddam and Gomorrah and of the Great Flood, right? Um, look at the differences, all that has happened in 2,000 years. However, to the Lord, we read that a thousand years is as a day and a day is a thousand years. It's only been a matter of a couple days. He's outside of time. And look at what humans have managed to do to the earth since then. Because we read in the book of Revelation of those who have hurt the earth and how much the earth is hurting these days. How much everything that we read, um, sinkholes in diverse places, sea life is dying, other animals with all kinds of different diseases, all of a sudden strange diseases. Um, look, at, look up, and, and this is going to sound weird, but I kid you not, that's what they're calling it, uh, some zombie illness that has hit the deer. Um, look at the plague that is hitting those animals by Yellowstone. Uh, look at the plague all over. Um, there's so many different illness, so many different diseases. You know, there, there is uh, er, there are earthquakes in diverse places. There are uh, volcanoes that were dormant for hundreds of thousands of years, waking up now in, in record number. We're having some very, very peculiar increase of uh, um, asteroid and comet flybys to Earth. You know, there was one, I don't know if it was in 2015, 16, or 17, that even changed the uh, comet flyby so close to Mars that it changed the atmosphere of Mars. Look it up. And so there's a, so much happening by way of, so, of signs in the sun, uh, in the moon, in the stars. Um, the, the sea and the waves, look at everything happening, that everybody living coastally uh, realizes then that there is an, um, an increase in the water levels. Um, we're having unprecedented uh, um, tornadoes and hurricanes. And, you know, things are different right now. And, and this is, I really believe, is the Lord shaking the earth trying to get the attention of humanity, of his creation before judgment, because there are too many signs that we're looking at. Um, when we look at a um, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, kingdom, understand that the word that was translated from the Greek as nation is ethos, uh, which we get the word ethnicity from. And we know that we have, um, and it means races. So there are races against races, ethnicities against ethnicities. There are people against people when it was God that, that, that made everybody so different, um, beautifully different, I might add. And, and yet we humans, some have elevated themselves in pride, which is an abomination to God, above others. You know, let me tell you something, please, please, let this sink in. Please, if you're a Christian, if you're a true follower of Christ, God died for all people, okay? Um, 
there are good and bad people in every race, in every job title. You can't, it's not fair. It's not fair to say that any one group has all bad people or any one job has all bad people because of some bad apples. You, it's not fair. There are born again Christians in every walk of life. And guess what? There, if you're a Christian and you're listening to this and you understand that to be true, and yet you're hating a certain group or race or, or whatever, you know, um, grouping, and you're classifying them all the same when there are good and bad in every area, every walk of life, you're going against what our Lord has commanded of us, that we love one another, that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so for you, not only that, but we are asked to pray for our enemies, pray for them to come to a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're told furthermore, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. And you need to read Ephesians 6 to understand what is going on in this world. Many antichrist spirits, many demonic activity, many people blinded and lost who have no idea somewhat what they're doing because they're, they're, they're listening to the voice that's speaking loudest in their head and they don't know Christ. God wants all people to be saved. But let me let you in on a little secret. If you don't know Christ, if you're not under the protection of God, the enemy sees you as fair game. And he sends spirits to inhabit your body, which is a temple. And, and the manifestation of those lying spirits gives, uh, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? You can tell a person you may not be able to see the heart of a person or their intentions, but after a while with a person, you can see their fruit. And those who belong to Christ resemble the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And love is, is, is paramount. And love is, 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 is the brightest light you see in them. Uh, because the Holy Spirit is the one that do, begins to do a work in you. Uh, when the word of God, which is a seed, falls on good ground. Listen, not to digress, because I know I've done just a little bit, but I just had to lay that the Holy Spirit is putting in my heart to just say something. Because I think that people are operating in hate and pleasing the father of lies. And that is not making Jesus Christ Lord over your life. If you're a child of God, you're supposed to be a light in this ever-growing dark world, not conforming to the ways of the world, not being friends with the world, which is an enemy of God. You cannot serve two. You're either going to please God or please the father of lies. And if you please the father of lies, you're going to follow him toward the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. When you, the Lord, has put you, child of God, to walk the path that leads toward the straight gate and narrow way that leads to life. It's a straight gate and narrow way. It's a defined path. The Lord has defined his path. He has a standard. Do you understand? You're either going to please God or you're going to please the enemy. And it's not about works. Please understand, it's not about works. But, but the Bible says if you don't have love in your heart, you have nothing. If you don't have love in your heart, you have nothing. You can be a martyr. You can be this, you can be that, you can know all the Bible. But if you don't have love, which is paramount, and the Lord has asterisks highlighted it, you have nothing. So I pray that you're not of those um, following the hate, following the darkness, walking toward the wide gate and broad way that leads toward destruction. And I pray instead that you're one of the prayer warriors, that you are praying every day ceaselessly and that you are you are a light in every dark situation that you walk in you should be a light you 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 cannot be hidden child of god okay so anyway let's continue so the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the lord 
uh, the prophet Amos 5.18, we read, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Remember, we are children of light, not of the darkness. Um, Amos 5.20, uh, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? even very dark and no brightness in it. Listen, when the church leaves, of course it's gonna be a dark time on the earth. Because remember that Jesus said he is the light of the world and he is our head and we are his body and we are the light of the world in this church age of grace, right? But when the church goes up, how dark will it be on this earth during that time? Um, I wanna talk about uh, something that we see in many parts of the Bible, but in specifically, I want to take you back to Second Thessalonians uh, 2, because I want to show you something. Paul says the same thing twice in two different ways. Now, I want you to notice that he is telling us in Second Thessalonians 2, 3, that there is a falling away first, right? He says that before even the man of sin being revealed. There's a falling away first, right? Right? And we've already distinguished that according to the original Greek word that was translated to a falling away, that can be a spiritual departure or a physical departure. And in context, by studying this chapter, according to what we know through the other uh, parts of the Bible, right? When speaking of um, the gathering together, the rapture, everything that we gather is how Isaiah 28, 9, and 10 gives us instructions as to how we come to understand doctrine. Taking precip upon precip, which means order, line upon line, here a little, there a little, gathering the puzzle pieces, right? gathering the prophetic puzzle pieces that were given, not adding or taking away, not going by our own understanding, not trying to bend and twist and take things out of scripture in order to force it to agree, agree with misinterpretations. We're only going by what we're given. So fact number one, a falling away, the original word apostasia can mean a physical and a spiritual departure. That's a fact. Okay. Now, fact number two, we are told that even before the man of sin is revealed, the very first thing that's going to happen is this, quote unquote, falling away, which we have found it's either a, it can mean both a physical departure and a spiritual departure. Okay. So I want to show you something. Paul uses what's called synonymous para, para, parallelism. I know I've said it before and I can't say it right now for whatever reason. This is, this little clip is not mine. It's from a teaching from a, a pastor who, uh, as I've mentioned before, he's very humble. He does not want to be named, but he is a wonderful pastor. And I wish he would just let me say his name. And I would say it to everyone because he is very good and he studies and rightly divides and speaks the truth boldly. Very humble man of God. And so we see here, Paul uses what's called synonymous Paral parallelism. I'm sorry, I can't say that word for whatever reason. Parallel, parallel, parallel. I'm not even going to try. So he uses this, <laughs> and we read that it's a poetic literary device which involves the repetition of one idea in successive lines. So the first half of a verse will make a statement, and the second half will essentially say the same thing in different words. I would refer you to go to gotquestions.org, one of my very favorite um, uh, uh, websites, and they will show you other examples that it has been used um, in uh, other parts of the Bible. It is something known. It is a thing, okay? And, and basically, Paul uses that. Remember, Paul was a... Uh, um, uh, scholarly. He went to school. He had his education, okay? And so he, um, he, I say went to school, but not in the sense that we know it. He was um, educated. He, uh, of all the apostles who were humble fishermen, he um, was very smart. He had his, um, uh, I say education, but there's another word for it, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, it, it's not coming to memory, but you understand what I'm saying. 
he was an educated man, a scholarly man, and he knew um, he remember he was he was of the tribe of Benjamin, so he knew of the Jewish ways, he knew of the Jewish teachings, okay, and he used um, this synonymous parallel parallelism parallelism um, this okay, and what I want to show you is when we read second Thessalonians two in one part it tells us that the falling away comes first, even before that man of sin is revealed. And then as you go down further, it says, only he that now letteth will let until he is moved out of the way. Okay, so, and then the Antichrist will be revealed. So he is saying, Paul, he, Paul is saying the same thing twice. There's a removal, a departure of something first before the man of sin is revealed, okay? So the falling away, again, it, it, that apostasia means, it can mean both spiritual and physical departure, okay? That comes first, and then the, the man of sin is revealed, and then in number, um, as we go down in Second Thessalonians 2, we read only he that now let it will let until he is moved out of the way and then the antichrist is revealed two different ways he says the very same thing so this is the first hint that i get that it has to be a physical departure because in context later on in the very same chapter we are speaking of a removal of something of a he right? Um, and we're going to be talking about that in a minute. It's in some um, vers versions of the, of the Bible, it calls uh, him a restrainer, right? The restrainer will restrain until he is moved out of the way. We'll talk about a little bit about the restrainer, but let's deal first with this falling away, okay? So keep in mind um, that word that I told you. Also keep in mind that I don't know how many are aware and this is something that, again, I learned from this pastor. I took another clip from his teaching. The first seven translation of the English Bible had departure and not falling away. And he, he begged the question, who was in charge back then? Who changed it? Because the first seven English translations of apostasia all rendered the noun as either departure or departing. They are as follows, and we and and they're listed um, with the year, right? Um, I have an example: Geneva Bible, Second Thessalonians two three to five, uh, fifteen ninety nine Geneva Bible, and you see there that it has departing first. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a departing first, and that that man of sin be disclosed, even the son of perdition, which we know is speaking of the Antichrist. So the very first thing before even the man of sin is revealed is that departing first. And I want you to put that in context with what we read um, uh, later on in Second Thessalonians to the same chapter, that only he that now led it is moved out of the way, and then the Antichrist is revealed, okay? So I would say, according to what we read, that it would appear to be the falling away and the being moved out of the way is speaking of the same thing. However, let's look at the details. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's study. Let's rightly divide. Let's take precip upon precip, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and let's, let's let God be true and every man a liar, okay? So, We've read this. Um, I want to read something to you that I got from IsraelMyGlory.org, which I thought was um, giving us more information about that time and the church in question, right? Because um, it's important that we understand um, what the atmosphere was like, what was it that they were possibly dealing with, and everything else that we read on here. So, according to this website, we read the following: one of the apostle, one of the apostle Paul's most important ministries took place place in Thessalonica. His letters to believers there show how he established churches early in his ministry, met with opposition, instructed new believers in doctrine, mentored Christians, and presented major themes on end times prophecies. Prophecy, uh, excuse me. So as we appear to be in the last days, it is especially important to study Paul's epistles to the Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, 
Thessalonians, including how and when the church was planted. I have no idea why I can't talk all of a sudden. Um, and so um, he references Acts 7, 1 through 10. We continue reading in the same uh, website. Thessalonica was established around 315 BC by Cassander, who named it after his wife Thessalonica, the half-sister of Alexander the Great. The Romans took the city in 168 BC and made it the capital of Macedonia in Greece. Thessalonica was a free city without a military force, governed by its citizens, and was more Greek than Roman in character. Its population estimated um, at 200,000 was made up of Greeks, Romans, and Jews. This, the same web, uh, website we continue reading. The city borders the Aegean Sea, providing access to the Mediterranean. Its location made it a major shipping center, second only to Corinth and Ephesus. Artisan, artisans, uh, merchants, and trade guilds made it wealthy, although most citizens performed physical labor of all types. Religious plural, pluralism, pluralism filled Thessalonica with all types of pagan cults, temples, and deities. Archaeological evidence indicates at least 25 gods were presented in heathen worship, including Zeus, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Artemis um, Aphrodite, Dionysus, Dionysus um, and the Roman emperor, to name a few. However, some Gentiles had become proselytes to Judaism and were known as God-fearers. All right, so that gives us an idea to a little bit of what was happening, the history of what we read over there. Now, I want to show you something. Um, from among the letters in the books that uh, Paul wrote, the letters of uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians were the earliest, 50 AD and 51 AD. And what I want to tell you is, obviously, 1 Thessalonians came before 2 Thessalonians, right? Um, here is from Got Questions, uh, and they give us, I'm sorry, this one was a little longer, so I don't know if I, I didn't catch them all, but this one has... Uh, uh, the majority of them, if not all of them. And I know that there were questions about Timothy, um, whether Paul wrote them, but I'm not going to address that right now. We're going to focus on 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, right? Because that is what we're talking about. We're discussing here. So know that it was one of the earlier writings, um, one of the first writings, the letters the, um, for, for uh, the, the baby Christian church that Paul had set up at a time of um, persecution and Paul, um, of course, was chased away and he could not confront them in person. So he wrote those letters, right, to the baby Christians from the church that he had just set up. Okay. Um, I want to read this. Um, it's from, I, I'm not familiar with uh, this organization or church. I'm not sure what it is, but I was reading some of the information that they had there and I thought it very interesting. So I have included a screenshot of this in there. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had been chased out of Macedonia, but they did not abandon the infant churches they left behind. Indeed, they were worried because the new believers in Thessalonica were being persecuted. Paul did not know how they would cope. Um, so I, I want to paint the picture it was a time of great persecution. Um, these baby Christians who Paul had spent, I don't know if it was three weeks or three months there when he was setting up that church, right? Um, all of a sudden they're, they're, they're hit with fear um, because of everything happening, the, the persecution. But, and remember, this is just at the beginning of the church, right? Um, the church was just beginning to get built. Um, it started with Jesus and it was continuing now with the apostles and they were just starting to build the church, right? Starting to do their portion, continuing Jesus' work, starting to do their portion of the unction they're given, right? By the Lord. And, and as led by the Holy Spirit, they did what God had wanted them to do here on earth, right? And so there was a time of great persecution. Remember, um, um, these are days where, where they were baby Christians and they were just learning how, how, how this, you know, Christian thing went, right? How, how this, what it meant to, to, um, follow Christ, right? Um, and they were suddenly bombarded with, um, these letters, scary letters in a scary time, um, lies 
forged letters in a scary time. And, and they were um, uh, beginning to wonder, wait, did we miss something? Did we miss this, 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 this thing, this departing, this, this thing which is supposed to happen before um, the day of the Lord? Are we now in the day of the Lord? Did we miss this thing that we were supposed to be looking for? Okay, and we're just going to pause there. And now I want to um, go a little further into Second Thessalonians 2, so we add on to what we've spoken so far. So I'm going to read this. Um, this is Second Thessalonians 2. We're beginning at 5, uh, verse 5. Um, Paul says to uh, the, the Thessalonians, um, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So what he is trying to comfort them with is something that he had spoken to them about before. Remember, 1 Thessalonians came before 2 Thessalonians. And when we try to think of, did Paul speak anything about a departure um, in 1 Thessalonians 4 that would have made sense and served as a sign and also a comfort that it hasn't happened yet because he's reminding them, listen, um, um, this happens first and then that time comes. Don't you remember I told you about this? This is me paraphrasing for him, right? Remember ye not that I was with you? I was yet with you. Uh, I told you these things. Anything remotely close to a departure is speaking of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. 16 to 18 that would have served as a comfort okay and when you study the other verses of the rapture as i have detailed in um part three of our rapture series then you'll understand that this just falls in place this complements it and falls in place perfectly when you study and rightly divide the word of god and you let god be true and every man a liar and you only read what you're given and you and you, and you study you study, you rightly divide, you take precip upon precip, line upon line, just as the Bible instructs us, with a humble heart, you cannot misinterpret this. You understand it, and, and it falls into place. So look at what he says. Remember you not, when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So I'm going to stop here for a minute because I want to dive into this. So we cannot ignore that word that I couldn't pronounce, the the. Let's go back to it really quick. That Paul is using synonymous parallelism, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but here it is. Um, that poetic device saying two things, two, saying the same thing, I'm sorry, twice. The falling away happens first. Only he that now letteth will let until he is moved out of the way. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. And then the wicked one comes for number one, the falling away, right? Um, so we're going to move on. Again, just a reminder. These are times when, when life with no cell phones, <laughs> there was no cell phones, right? There were no computers. Um, most of the information many times, because there was no New Testament, right? Most of the information was usually word of mouth, right? That people were uh, speaking with. Um, remember when, uh, um, for many times, for, for a long time, uh, it was word of mouth that the information was being spread uh, for a good long period of time until uh, the first Bible, the first uh, Bibles were put together. And remember, even then, um, Rome would uh, not allow people to have Bibles, right? When they set up the universal church, the Catholic church, but that's another, another teaching. So this, this spiritual adultery that many, I'm sorry, spiritual adultery, I'm sorry, the spiritual um, um, departure that many claim that that second Thessalonians is speaking of, I have a hard time with, because at a time with no phones, no computers, 
the, the church is just starting, there's great persecution, how in the world would they have physically seen a spiritual departure so that it served as a sign of what they were about with that the the day of the lord the day of christ was at hand do you understand i believe that the falling away that paul is trying to comfort them telling them that that happens first is not something that is not visibly seen i believe it's something that they will have to um understand as per the first as per what he has spoken to them about before because that's what second thessalonians says right um remember ye not that when i was with you i told you these things and we see in uh first thessalonians uh four that he speaks of um uh, the Lord himself, right? And, and we read what, what uh, the catching away, um, rapture, uh, harpazo, right? Um, is a physical departure of the church, right? The church will no longer be here on earth, standing in these corrupt bodies, but we will be changed, right? So I, I, I have a hard time believing that the second Thessalonians to sign that uh, Paul would have been comforting them with that they should have known that is something that he would have ex have spoken to them about before, so that they would have known that they were not um, that the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, had not come yet. Is that this departure was a physical one that they would have seen, because there was no way for them to have seen a spiritual departure when how much of the earth was part of the church back then when it was just starting do you understand so it was i don't believe that it was a spiritual departure because when we look at all the facts and we look at uh, uh what is said here with the one who now let it will let until he take he's taken out of the way and then the wicked one is revealed is in parallel is a parallel verse to what we read about the falling away and i believe is a physical departure because that is what this is this is a physical departure somebody a he moved out of the way so we're going to talk about that because i think it's important that we put the two together and understand what we're being told right there instead of just you know what so many people are saying it's this way so i'm just going to jump on the bandwagon and believe it blindly without looking at it without researching it myself and then not only will you not have researched yourself, you're passing it on as fact and arguing in forums or comments uh, when you haven't studied yourself, there's something wrong with that. Study, rightly divide, um, um, look at the original language. You know, there are so many ways that we can research uh, the matter out and find the truth and ask Holy Spirit to help you. He is so real and he will help you. God wants to give you wisdom and give it to you abundantly, okay? So, when we're talking about a physical departure versus a spiritual departure, one that would serve as a sign that could visibly be seen to me is a physical departure. And again, this is another one of um, the charts that has, uh, this is not originally mine. I, I copied it and I thought I put down who I got it from. I will have to list it on the bottom. I pray that I'll remember. Um, but this is also showing you which versions of the Bible had departing um, versus falling away. Okay. Now, I want to show you something with respect to speaking of the restraining force on earth. Okay. Because we're going to talk a little bit about the he that now let it will let until he is moved out of the way. Right. It's a physical move out of the way, right? And then the Antichrist will be uh, revealed. And the falling away, which I believe is a physical falling, a physical departure rather, um, that also is before the Antichrist is revealed, okay? So there is, that's a parallel verse, and Paul is saying the same thing twice in two different, excuse me, two different ways, and it cannot be ignored. So let's talk about the he. What power can restrain Satan? What power are we told in the Bible is greater than the one in the world? Well, let's, let's look at what is being done in the world, right? 
Um, the prophet Zechariah in, in, in chapter four, verse six, that we, we learned the following. Then he answered and spake unto me, the angel to Zechariah saying, this is the word of the Lord. We know who the word of the Lord is, right? Unto Zerubbabel saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The work that is being done on the earth today is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The church that Jesus built and purchased with his precious blood has become the temple of God that houses the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, of which blasphemy against is unforgivable. The body of Christ has become the temple of God. And in it, in that body, one body, many parts, is the Holy Spirit. And the work being done on this earth, although God has power, although God has might, and we saw so much of it, we read so much of it in Old Testament times, the, pow the, the thing being done on this earth right now is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And what do we read in John 16, 7 through 11? Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for, for you that I go away. And if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. That means expose and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan is a defeated foe. What he is doing right now, he came to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to seal as many to him so that they follow his fate into the lake of fire. And he will say and do whatever he can to take as many as possible with him. If today in this church age of grace, you do not get sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit with the seal of God in the unseen by accepting Jesus as your savior, you will be plunged into the next time segment, the next thing on God's prophetic clock, if you do not belong to Christ. There is a Salvation means so much more than this world understands. And we're understanding more and more of it as we go closer to that day of the Lord's, um, of the Lord saving his people, rescuing his people. Salvation means rescue. And so understand that this time that we're living in, the Lord has his arms open. And he is saying, come to me. I want to save you. I, I want to give you my Holy Spirit. Okay? I, I want to mark you as mine. So that when I come, I'll get you. Yet, many people are saying, no thanks. I'll pass. Not understanding that if you don't, you're going to be here for the next segment of time that is coming. A very wicked time where evil incarnate will walk the land for seven years. And yes, seven years. And I would, I haven't published it yet, but there is a video that I'm working on. Um, and I apologize, I should have already have released it and I have not. I promise I did not forget about it. It's explaining the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, that seven year time that has the great tribulation and time of Jacob's trouble in it. Um, I promise to try and get it out by next week, um, but I have not forgotten about it, okay? But that way that will help you understand. Listen, if you understand the plan of God and you take what he gives you and not add or take away from it and you humble your heart and take what God gives you instead of relying on your own um, understanding or glorifying yourself in pride, which is an abomination to God and trying to bend and twist God's word to try to be right. There's no, for what? For what do you want to be right? Listen, if you're one of these people that are filled with pride and you argue as the Pharisees did with Jesus, right? If you argue with the word of God to get self-glory here 
in this short time that you're on earth and, and you're kicking your eternity aside because you'd rather be prideful and right and glorified on earth than go with the one who, who, des who deserves rightfully all the glory by humbling yourself to his truth and receiving what he has for you because the word of God sanctifies it, sets you apart as holy unto God. You have a choice to make, right? Um, so we see then that the work being done, and I'm digressing, I apologize. The, the work being done right now on the earth is by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by power, not by might, but by God's spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives where? Inside the body of every believer in Christ. We have become the temple of God, right? Um, the Holy Spirit lives in us. He lives in us. Not by power, not by might, but by God's spirit. And what do we read? What do we read the comforter will do? When he has come, he will reprove, which means expose the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me. Jesus, Jesus is talking of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. What else do we read about the Holy Spirit? Well, we go to first John four, four. And what do we read? Year of God, little children and have overcome them because greater is he in you than he that is in the world who is in you child of god the holy spirit right the holy spirit greater is the holy spirit in you than he that is in the world who's the he in the world satan he's a created being right but the holy spirit is one part of the fullness of god of the godhead right god the father god the son god the holy spirit one god made up of three parts right and so what else do we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18? We read the following. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy the body. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. The Holy Spirit lives inside the body of every born again believer in Christ. Remember that Jesus said, you must be born again to see and to enter the kingdom. When you are born again, you believe Christ, you confess with your mouth and believe with your, mouth and believe with your heart, you receive the Holy Spirit of God in you that seals you with the mark of God in the unseen, right? And, and that Holy Spirit is greater than the one in the world. You are sealed until the day of redemption. You are sealed until Jesus comes for his purchased possession. You are sealed until the day that the Lord redeems this body. If you look at Romans 8, right? So I, the wheels should start turning in your head as you think of 2 Thessalonians 2 again. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 20, we read the following. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. This is speaking of spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication. When you bow to another, when you've been espoused to one. The, if you go to Revelation 2, 19 to 23, that is one example of things that will get you cast into the great tribulation is spiritual adultery and spiritual fornication. You've been espoused to one. one you're supposed to keep your, your garments clean, not defile them, right? By bowing to another, worshiping another, right? Um, let me continue 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit flee fornication, especially speaking of spiritual fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Listen, since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has come to indwell and seal every believer in Christ, every member of Jesus' church that he built and purchased with his precious blood, right? 
his body, right? His bride. Since Pentecost, before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit de did things a little bit different. Since Pentecost, however, the church has become the temple of God on the earth. Before Pentecost, remember there was a physical temple made with human hands. And after we leave, after this temple leaves at the last day of the church age of grace, then in the 70th week, what do we see in, in Revelation 11? There will be a physical temple, a third Jewish temple, of which I might add, let me tell you, they already have the altar made. They've dedicated it. Um, they have uh, the high priest chosen in Israel. Um, they have the temple plans. Uh, there's a lot going on right now that tell us, hey, that 70th week is very close. And if we read in scripture that the rapture happens before that 70th week, how much closer are we to the redemption of Jesus, of Jesus' precious bride, of his body, of his church? So when we think of us, the church, the faithful church that Jesus purchased with his precious blood, that one that Ephesians 5, that the two, Jesus and the church, shall be one, it's a spiritual marriage. This temple that exists in the earth during this church age of grace that has been here since Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost and from then has been indwelling inside the body of every believer in Christ, of his body, Jesus' body, okay? And the Holy Spirit, we're going to see in a little bit, the Holy Spirit has an active part in the rapture. And I want to show you something that I think is just so mind-blowing is why I believe is the restraining force on earth because we are given power. The church is given power over all the powers of the enemy by the power of Jesus' name, by the power of his spirit, and by the power of his blood. The church is given power over all the powers of the enemy. The church belongs to Jesus. He is our head. We are his body, right? And he, Jesus, has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He had victory, right? And greater is he in us than he that is in the world. And he that now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. And where the Holy Spirit goes, we go. Okay? So let's keep reading. In Acts 8, 36 to 40, we read the following. This is the part where Philip uh, was baptizing the eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Oh, I get goosebumps when I read that. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, Azotus, sorry if I mispronounced that, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till all came to Caesarea. Listen, let me go back to 39 because I think you missed that. Acts 8 39. That phrase caught away is harpazo. The very same word that is uh, translated to caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, I think it's 17, which speaks of the rapture. One of the main rapture verses that caught up, harpazo, that because of the Latin, we get the word rapture, is caught away. The same word is being used here, caught away, harpazo, for Philip. So by the power, and who did it? Who, 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 who caught away Philip? Who, who harpazos Philip? The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, caught away Philip so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he was just so happy and filled with the Spirit himself. He was quite fine that one moment Philip was there, the next moment he was gone. And he had the joy of the Lord in him, he being the eunuch, 
and he was quite fine with it. He went on his way rejoicing. Hallelujah and praise to God. And we know that feeling of joy, of the joy of the Lord, don't we? And we should have the peace of the Lord these days. And we should be being a light in this, in this earth right now. The little bit of time that I believe is left, that we should be a light in this ever-growing dark world. We should, world, we should be praying ceaselessly, both for those we love, for ourselves, for our churches, for our pastors, even for um, our enemies. We should be prayer warriors. That's part of our spiritual armor. Um, we should be praying. You know, remember Daniel prayed three times a day. Some people ask me how many times should I pray? Daniel prayed three times a day. Um, how, how often, you know, I mean, listen, pray with your heart. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Pray with your heart. Pray pray everything that the holy spirit puts on your heart to pray pray and, and keep praying um pray and and so we see here that by the power of the holy spirit philip was caught away physically harpazo from one place to another physically by the power of the holy spirit and i believe the holy spirit will have a huge part in our being departed from this earth you know, a lot of people have mentioned and asked, well, isn't Michael a better candidate for the restraining force? But I want to remind you um, of something that we read here about the Archangel Michael. Now, I believe he's a powerful Archangel, and, and, but I believe he has uh, uh, also an unction. He has something that the Lord has him doing, and it's not that he can't, but I believe that there is something that he is allowed and not allowed to do as per what God's plan and for his glory is. And so we read in June, Jude 9 the following, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So it's not that I think that the archangel Michael couldn't, you know, go toe to toe with the enemy is that I believe there's a plan of God and that the plan of God is by the power of his Holy Spirit. And I believe that the archangel, um, his mission is over the people of um, Israel because that's what we read. And I don't know if I included any here. I might not have, and I apologize. If I did not, excuse me. But if you look, I think it's in the book of Daniel. We read about... Um, I think it's Daniel 12, 10, excuse me, um, where um, we read that the archangel Michael is who looks over the people of Israel, or rather, um, he has a very active role with the people of Israel, particularly in these last days, and I believe especially during the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Um, because we read that he stands. What was he doing? What is he sitting during these days that the Lord has punished uh, Israel for having broken covenant? Um, because remember, there is, uh, there's a reason why the, the precious people of God have suffered so much. The Lord has, has, is not done with them, but he did promise to punish them in measure, right? especially when we're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Um, but the Lord has not finished with his people. According to Romans 11, Paul, who himself was of the tribe of Benjamin, has said the Lord is not finished with the people of Israel, right? Um, um, but he has promised to punish them in measure up to the third and fourth generation for everything they have done against the Lord. Because remember, when they first signed that first covenant, there were um, things that, that they was explained to them, if you break covenant, this, 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 and this will happen, okay, this many times, okay? So um, when we read um, about the Archangel Michael, I, I, I believe there was a reason why Michael didn't do but say, the Lord rebuke you. Rebuke, rebuke thee to Satan, okay, versus um, j taking action against him. I don't believe it's because he couldn't, because God's angels are mighty in power themselves, right, we read, but it's, I believe that there is a reason, there is a, a, a thing that the Lord is doing on this earth, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
which is why I think there are distinct differences between what you see now on this earth and what you read about before in the Old Testament, because although God has power and God has might, and we know that the two witnesses, when they manifest on the earth during that 70th week, we know that they will um, um, have the powers of both Moses and Elijah um, that they demonstrated uh, during that 70th week, right? But during this church age of grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is doing an amazing thing. And, and I believe there's a reason why in Ecclesiastes 9.8 we read, let thy garments be always white and let thy head lack no ointment and we know that the ointment was always in reference of the holy spirit of being filled with the holy spirit of god right we know that we read the parable of the the virgins right the ten virgins um the wise ones had oil in their lamps right um we we cannot ignore all these things that were told in scripture all scripture is profitable right but we cannot ignore what we're given and I believe that from everything that we've studied here today, um, that everything that we read in the word of God, even the parallel verses that we read in Second uh, Thessalonians uh, 2, we cannot ignore that the falling away, the factual information on the original Greek word it, from the original manuscript, it means a spiritual departure but it also means a physical departure so when you study that and only that is when you should be able to grasp from it in context which one we're looking at is it a spiritual departure that happens first before the antichrist is revealed or is it a um, um is it a physical or is it a, a spiritual obviously because in in that time there were no phones there was uh, no internet there was no um uh, television even how in the world would they have seen a spiritual departure if that would have served as a sign of a time that's coming right because paul is trying to comfort them from something they thought they may have missed because of the time at hand and these false letters they were receiving right um the the day of the lord will not happen until a falling away a departure happens first and and when we read in context the whole chapter we see that there is a removal of a restraining force and then that wicked one is revealed falling away departure happens first before the antichrist and then later on only he that now let it will let until he is moved out of the way the he is the holy spirit which we read is greater than the one in the world the he is inside the church right the church is the body of christ right the church is um um we are jesus purchased possession right and if we read all other um rapture verses if you have um, studied and and followed through with all this the whole series that I this is part seven if you've looked at all of the others especially part three that speaks on a pre-tribulation rapture and tells you who that group is in revelation four and five who is crowned with gold crowns of of, of salvation a uh, kingly crowns right who is clothed in white raiment, uh, speaking of glorification, uh, who is seated on the throne, overcomer promise that was only promised to the church, um, who is singing about being redeemed by Jesus' blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, who is singing about being made kings and priests and reigning. If it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's a duck. To me, that group can be no one else if you stand on the promises that God gave only to the church. And we, we read in Hebrews 11 that even those of Old Testament time to whom the promises were made, um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, right? Uh, we read that even those of Old Testament time shall not be made perfect, which speaks of glorification without us. And yet you see somebody up there and and don't forget that we read that no one has gone to heaven up until this point no one has gone to heaven except he that came from heaven which is jesus we cannot ignore these details we we have to take what the lord has given us we are not to add or take away from what is there we are not to rely on our own inter interpretation we are definitely not to bend and twist scripture just to force it try and force it to agree with an interpretation in order to be right in pride which is an abomination to the lord and the lord resists the proud
So um, I believe with all my heart more than ever that now the church is understanding more and more the prophecies of the Lord. When I read in the, in the book of Daniel that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased, I don't believe that's about airplanes. I don't believe that's about computers, though that is a popular thing that many explain that away with. I believe that the knowledge that many are increasing in is knowledge of God, of his Christ, and his kingdom. And throughout scripture, that's what supports that because wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. So how in the world can it be about airplanes and computers and that's not biblical. Today in these last days, God is pouring out his spirit and many are prophesying, many are understanding, many are being filled with God's spirit and understanding the wisdom from above because by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I believe from what we have studied, from diving in and digging in and, and with much prayer that 2 Thessalonians 2 is not telling us a spiritual departure. 2 Thessalonians 2 is talking about a physical departure that happens before, and it falls in line with the church being in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5 before Jesus even opens the first seal. Remember when Jesus opens that first seal, he unleashes the Antichrist in his full conquering power in order for him to confirm the covenant with many. And when he confirms the covenant with many, that begins that seven year clock. Um, and it is a seven year clock. 70, 70 weeks were determined, 70 times seven, 490. Only 483 have come out. And again, I know that sounds confusing. I'll try not to dive into that right now because there's no time. And I want to make sure to give proper time to that subject about the 70th week so that you understand it and you can follow through and follow along whenever we speak of it, okay? So um, from what I have read, 2 Thessalonians 2 is speaking of a physical departure and the rest of the chapter in context also supports that as well as the other verses when speaking about the rapture okay all right now first timothy 4 1 says the following now the spirit that's capital s holy spirit expressly says that in later times some sh will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Um, normally uh, in the King James, um, I'm trying to remember how it says, um, many will depart the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Yes, we know that many will depart the faith in the last days. And, and this here is what a lot of people will use to weakly support a spiritual departure for 2 Thessalonians 2. <clears throat> this is separate. This is telling us, yes, in the last days, many will depart the faith. We have false preachers, false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, we have many that have given into their flesh and they want to, they're making up their own um, flavor of Christianity. Um, this is something that has existed even before, um, that where people have, um, uh, changed, you know, remember what Paul said, um, many will follow, um, you know, he, and I'm trying to remember which verse he spoke. It was in the book of Acts, I believe maybe 10, um, where he's talking about that he, he, he tries to, he tried to explain it to us with tears for like three days. And he says, um, you know, there are many that will make disciples for themselves. Um, um, but they're false. They're, they're teaching false ways. You know, we're, we're warned by Peter. We're warned by Jesus. We're warned by Paul. You know, at the mouth of two to three witnesses, a thing will be established. Deception, deception has existed since Jesus left the earth. Many have tried to make their own disciples and make their own ways. How many of the false religions that exist today existed back then? You'll find not many. It was only after Jesus left that many of these religions began to surface. You know, there have been religions that have existed, um, religions that Satan himself has uh, inspired. Um, you need to understand that the Tower of Babel, many things happened during that time. And there are many things that we read about um, the false deities um, that were conjured up 
uh, starting at that point that stemmed from that moment, from that time. And so that's another um, teaching, but we can't be sloppy with interpretation. We have to be very careful what we read in the Bible and careful to um, misrepresent it. Um, we are to study and we are to rightly divide. And we are to use Isaiah 28, 9, and 10 that gives us instructions as to how we come to understand doctrine. And then once we learn the truth, root yourself in it. Stand firm, nothing wavering on what God said. Because if you take the word of God and only apply it weekly on the surface, and you believe it maybe weekly, you know, like very, in a very weak way, one foot in the world, one foot in Christ, very weakly. I'm not firm. You don't make Jesus your firm foundation, the word of God, your firm foundation. Then you're going to be carried around by every wind of doctrine. Um, I believe from what I have read, speaking in 2 Thessalonians 2, by diving in, as we just did, that that is speaking of a physical departure. And the rest of the chapter in context, along with the verses of the rapture uh, throughout the Bible, support that. Um, the church will have no part of that seven-year period of time. And, and we will not be here when the Lord opens that first seal because the book of Revelation shows us in heaven, um, in our position of inheritance and promise, joint heirs with Christ before Jesus even opens that first seal. And we know this is so because judgment first begins at the house of God. We're told in Luke 21, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up for your redemption draws near. How do the things begin? Well, um, we read in Matthew 24, uh, the, in the parallel verses, um, uh, kingdom will go, nation will go against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes, plagues, and uh, diverse places, um, pestilence, and I'm, I'm going by memory, so forgive me if I didn't say it in order, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. These are the beginning of sorrows, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up for your redemption draws near. And oh, look at that, Revelation 4 and 5, a group singing the new song of redemption by Jesus, blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation before Jesus opens the first seal, okay? So, Yes, you will read verses in the, in the Bible like this one that tell us, yes, many will depart the faith, but we've been warned. We've been warned, um, um, take heed that you don't go, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and follow the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We're told there will be deception. There will be many that pretend to be Christ, and, and there are many. Um, and they will deceive many. You know, um, they, many will depart the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Is It is happening. There is so much um, deception. And how do you discern, child of God, with the word, um, through the filter of the word of God? Knowing the truth of God, you are better able to recognize deception when it confronts you. So I pray that this has helped you understand the Second Thessalonians 2. It is representing uh, from what I have studied, from what we have um, presented here, a physical departure. Um, it would have been impossible to see a spiritual departure in order for that to have served as a sign. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that um, when we hear Paul say something like, remember I told you about these things, um, as he did in Second Thessalonians, is something he would have taught them before, and we know that um, before Second Thessalonians two came, First Thessalonians, and we know that First Thessalonians four speaks of the rapture. So to me, it is speaking of a physical departure in reference to the rapture. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father Almighty God, I thank you so very much for everything you have given us this day. And I just pray that you bring understanding to all our hearts, Father. Let us know your truth, Father. We want to give you the glory, the honor, the praise. And we just thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done, everything that you continue to do, and everything you have yet to do. We pray that we are accounted worthy to escape those things that are coming upon the world and to stand before the Son of Man, clothed in white raiment. And we say to you, Lord Jesus, come. And we thank you for loving us as imperfect as we are. We ask that you bless every individual, Father. 
that has that has tuned in to listen or that they're watching the video and i just pray that you bless them abundantly with your wisdom in jesus mighty name we pray and all god's children say amen thank you very much god bless you bye-bye